You're watching BCTV. We're all about Brantford. You're watching BCTV, Brantford Government Television, a service of Brantford Community Television. This program is brought to you in part through the support of the Town of Brantford. Okay, let me just check uh, to see who's here. Joe Chadwick, are you here? Recording in progress. Joe Chadwick is pre Joe Chadwick is present and thank, the strange thank mouse. Thank, thank you, Joe. Sorry, <laughs> Fred. Fred Russo. Fred, are you here? Fred Russo present. Joe Vayuso. Joe, are you here? Joe Vayuso. I see your name. Now Joe's muted. Joe Bayuso. Joe? Present. Yeah, great. Excellent. Uh, Marcy Pelusi. Marcy. Marcy's here. Excellent. Sharon Hutner. Sharon? Sharon is here. And Massimo. Massimo Liguri. Are you here? And Massimo Liguri is here. Great. Excellent. Okay, so we'll call this meeting of the Brantford Planning Zoning Commission to order. It's Thursday, January 5th, 2023. I have 7.04 p.m. Uh, members of the commission uh, just introduced. I'm also Chuck Anders Chair. Our staff this evening is our town planner, Harry Smith. Harry, you're here. I'm here. Our assistant planner, Evan Brining. Evan, you're here. Mm -hmm. Here. And our clerk recording secretary, Lurking in the background is Michelle Martin. Uh, we're following our normal, normal format for public hearings, which is that the applicant goes first, uh, makes its presentation. After that, we turn it over to uh, the commission and staff. Staff typically has a staff report. We ask them to summarize, open up for question comments from the commission members. After we finish that portion, we open it up to the public, ask for the public to comment, uh, make your public comments, identify yourself, uh, and uh, make your comments, and then we allow the applicant to respond to the public comments. We may or may not close the public hearing. A number of the hearings tonight are either not going to be opened or will be continued. I can tell you that right off the bat, including 94 East Main Street. I know that's a controversial one. That one is going to be continued. Just to let you, let you guys know, we had a request from the applicant. To vote. So, uh, but uh, that's our normal process. Uh, and uh, Evan, do you want to review with us the process for public participation? Uh, sure. If you would like to participate during the public hearing, down at the bottom of your screen, there is a reactions button. You can select that and you, it gives you a few options. Uh, you can press raise your hand to indicate that you would like to speak. Uh, you can also type into the chat that you want to participate and if you're calling in, you can press star nine, and we ask that everybody state their name at the beginning of their comment or question. Great, Chuck Anders Chair. Thank you, Evan. <laughs> uh, with that, we'll re have the read the legal notice of public hearing, and I guess our, our new secretary, uh, Fred. Fred, have you got the legal notice? I have it here. Uh, legal notice, Town of Brantford. The Planning and Zoning Commission of the Town of Brantford, Connecticut, Hereby gives notice of public hearings to be held on Thursday, January 5th, 2023 at 8 p.m. by remote technology to consider the applications listed below. Information regarding how to participate in the public hearings will be provided on the commissioner's meeting agenda that will be posted on the town's website at least 24 hours prior to the meeting. Number one, application number 22-11.2-11. Lot resubdivision located at 175 Cherry Hill Road, BC Investments Properties, LLC, in care of Bruno Ciccone, applicant and owner. Number two, application number 22-11.3-11.2-11. 
special exception for an interior rear lot, section 6.11, uh, lot number five, located at 175 Cherry Hill Road. BC Investment Properties, LLC, care of Bruno Ciccone, applicant and owner. Number three, application number 22-11.4, special exception for an interior rear lot, section 6.11, lot number two, located at 175 Cherry Hill Road, BC Investment Properties, LLC, care of Bruno Ciccone, applicant and owner. Number four, application 20, number 22, that's 11.5, special exception for grading, section 6.8 for a home addition, located at 91 Standard Avenue, Allen and Cynthia Brooks, applicants and owners. And number five, application number 22-11, Point six, special exception for an oversized accessory structure garage, section 3.8, located on 104 Cherry Hill Road, Gene Ferricelli, applicant and owner. At said hearings, all persons will have the right to be heard. Copies are on file in the Planning and Zoning uh, Commission's office at the Planning and Zoning Department, 1019 Main Street, Brantford, Connecticut, 06405. Written communications may be sent to the above address to Planning and Zoning at Brantford-Connecticut.gov, Brantford Planning and Zoning Commission, uh, Chuck Andrews, uh, chairperson. Chuck Andrews here. Thank you, Fred. Excellent job. Thank you. Uh, we'll start then with our first public hearing, which is Westford Real Estate Management, LLC. That's Jefferson Woods Community, 11-404 Jefferson Woods. This is a special exception, actually an after the fact special exception modification for the construction of additional parking. This is a matter, I think we opened a public hearing back in September and uh, there was uh, a need for some additional information from the applicant, particularly regarding landscaping, lighting, fence details and so forth. And uh, uh, so hopefully, uh, we, we've made progress. Is the applicant ready to proceed with that? Uh, yes, Chuck. Uh, Jim Preddy, Chris Colo Engineering here at 420 East Main Street in Brantford. Uh, also on is uh, attorney Andrea Dunn and John um, Fishman from Westford. Um, so uh, I'll back up to the last meeting, uh, which I believe you're right, was in September. Um, the very next morning, um, John had that the offending light um, disconnected uh, and it's been off ever since um, until we got this sorted out. So, um, you know, in an effort to try to be good neighbors, they, they went out the next day and turned that light off. Um, we have since um, had a lighting consultant take a look at that and there's been a whole bunch of iterations about lowering the pole and uh, we have a uh, an ISOLEX plan now with a, a single fixture that faces, instead of in both directions, just faces away from the property line with the rear side shield and the lower pole. And now um, we've, we've sent that in. Um, I believe Evan reviewed it and said that we now meet all the, you know, light level uh, requirements in the regulations and it's showing zero foot candles over the property line. So I think we've resolved that issue. That, um, um, uh, Westford has agreed to lower the fence. Um, and additionally, we have had Larry Appleton, we hired Larry Appleton to um, put together a, a landscape plan for this area, uh, which I can put on the screen. Hopefully y'all could see that. Um, so these are the parking spaces and these are the two neighboring houses. Um, uh, what we had proposed to do was plant uh, emerald green arborvitaes along the back of the fence here and the back of the fence here. And then in between uh, a number of other arborvitaes and some forsythia and, and um, to basically uh, kind of bridge the gap and provide screening for you know, any other light that is, would, could possibly shine in that direction. Um, we have, Larry had put together a section here and this doesn't represent every spot, but some some areas are a little more level, but um, 
uh, this is just one of the sections where there is there is a little bit of slope here. Um, so, which is why we had placed them up against the fence. Um, so this is where we stand as of today. Uh, my there was a letter from the neighbor's attorney um, that we received this afternoon. They are asking us to um, push the arbor vitaes um, to the property line, which we certainly can do. Um, uh, they may not be exactly on the property line, but you know, with given the topography and what's going on there, well, we can certainly get them as close as we can. Um, and they're also asking to double the number of um, arborvitaes from 20 to 40. Um, and again, that was came this afternoon. Uh, but um, so here we are. Uh, this is what this is. I you know kind of bring you up to date. This is what's happened since the last meeting. Um, again. Uh, John and Andrea are also on, and they can speak to some of this as well. Uh, Chuck Anderson, thank you, Mr. Preddy. Um, Evan, did you, um, I, I think you had prepared the original staff report. Did you uh, look at this additional information and do you have additional information for us? Uh, yes, I did not update the staff report. However, I did prepare some conditions of approval that the commission did want to approve tonight. Um, the, the updated lighting plan that they gave us is uh, compliant with section 6.7. Um, however, um, the proposed landscaping, just by nature of how close the parking spaces are to the property line, they won't be able to meet the side yard landscaping requirements. Um, so if I could share my screen very quickly. You guys see this uh, Word document in front of you? Yes. Um, therefore, you know, looking at what um, Mr. Appleton had prepared for us, um, the commission would have to decide to use the finding of excellence in landscaping um, to essentially say that they met the requirement as much as they, they possibly could. Um, I did have some additional um, conditions, um, but uh, I did want to hear maybe a discussion amongst yourselves and even comments from the neighbors um, to find out. Uh, Jim, could you just confirm, were you guys willing to double the amount of arborvitae? Um, so I, that, again, that came this afternoon and I have not heard from John yet. Um, John, are you here? Uh, yeah. Um, so talking over with a landscape designer that the 20 that they proposed um, was pretty much at that time because of the slope of the land was pretty much the max they could do to have the plants survive. Um, he found areas behind that fence area where um, there wasn't as much of a slope. So doubling it, according to the landscape experts, is very unlikely. Um, those those plants do grow uh, rather quickly and large within a year or two or less. Um, but because of the slope of the land, the landscape designer didn't think that that was feasible for 40 of them. But we are willing to consider as many as possible that could fit um, that area. Sure. Um, but you guys were willing to move those plantings as close to the property line. Um, Absolutely. Okay. Cool. Yeah. When I, when I talked to the landscapers about it, he says, we will absolutely do put it as close as possible, but due to the slope, it might not be on the property line, but we will do our best. Absolutely. All right. And, uh, I think they also had a third request for, uh, the fencing to be completed or essentially going from two fences to one. So there's one flush fence across the entire space for the parking spaces. Um, but I believe uh, Jim had said to me this afternoon when we spoke that um, you guys put extra landscaping in that area to try yep. to imitate the effect that that would have. Um, 
Absolutely. Yeah, you know, we, we actually did put arborvitaes in that area to close that area, and they should be pretty much touching. The reason why the fence was not put in there originally was because of the vegetation and the steep slope that was already there. Um, they could not, it, it was, the fence was put up before my time, but just from understanding and talking through everyone is um, the thickness of the vegetation that's already there in the slope, it wasn't feasible. And what oh, about yes. the original the fence yes. down to the ground? Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I'm sorry. But to answer your original question, absolutely, there is uh, Arbor Buddies um, proposed to be in that area in between the two fences. Gotcha. And what about bringing the fences down to the ground? We weren't going to bring it down to the ground, but we agreed to lower them even more. Um, the concern was, um, and I think some of the neighbors brought it up, um, was when people are coming around the, the, the corner, um, you know, some of the lights might go over the fence. That's why we had the fence a little bit higher, but we are willing to lower it. But also the plants that are going to be behind the fence will, um, will be there to obstruct any lights that possibly could go under. Sure. And we're, we're larger arborvitae that might, you know, make up for some of those gaps. Was that an option or? Um, it's a possibility. Um, the reason why the landscape architect picked those specific um, emeralds was because they're a little bit hardier and, um, and survival rate is better than some other ones. Sure. Um, I did propose as part of this, or as one of our conditions that um, just anticipating what the commission had has discussed the last few uh, months that um, native plants be used as much as possible. Yep. And I know we do have a landscape architect on the meeting with us tonight. Um, and I'm pretty sure that arborvitaes are not native species. So is there any possibility that a different type of planting would be used in that space? Um, we could I'd definitely consider that. Gotcha. I don't know what else you'd use to get the same kind of density though. Sure. Um, Marcy, can I chime in? Absolutely. So the Emerald Greens has a really wide base, which is gonna give the, the dual lot to block any car headlights. I'm sure that's why Larry proposed that, you know, given the scale of the space and the arrangement and the situation, you know, I do feel that there's good justification to not be overly um, hung up on the fact that they're not native. You're really trying to set a, a nice green screen to get the lights out of there. And I don't know what other plant I would propose that would have a better chance of surviving other than, you know, maybe an Eastern red cedar, but, um, I would defer to Larry to see if that's something he would, you know, I'm not sure you would accomplish the same coverage as quickly if you use that. <clears throat> sure. But that would be the only one I can think that would be narrow enough to maybe fit the space off the top of my head. Okay. Thanks, Marcy. Yep. Um, so the other, I'll just run through the rest of the conditions real quick. Um, all construction, uh, site work, and proposed building on the sub subject property is limited to and shall substantially follow that depicted on the most recent submission submitted revisions or site plans. Um, prior to the issuance of a zoning permit, uh, the landscaping shall be revised to include as many native species, species as possible to the satisfaction of the town planner, uh, as well as planting shall be moved as close as possible to the property line. Um, any lighting has to be compliant with section 6.7 um, and to ensure compliance with the zoning regs, all landscaping must be maintained as an ongoing requirement of this approval to ensure the survival of the landscaping. Um, this afternoon, I also added that installation of the proposed landscaping shall be completed within six months of the date of this approval. I think that's essentially the planting season uh, for this spring. Um, and the site may the site plan may be modified as necessary to the satisfaction of the town planner 
to include EV charging stations. Uh, I think we've been adding that one to some of the larger sites in town. I thought it might be appropriate here as well. Um, so before we bring it to the public, uh, do any commissioners have any comments or, or any uh, reconsiderations I should give to these conditions? Uh, Chuck Anders, Chair. Uh, Evan, I, I don't. I would like to hear what the public comments are um, you know, in response to the... I, I mean, the issues were how many are provided. It sounds like doubling maybe too much, but somewhere between 20 and 40 is what they're saying, and, and how do we get the number? And then are they okay with the... It said they would bring it down, but not all the way, but how far down does that satisfy the concerns in light of the existing vegetation? So I'd like to kind of hear what the um, public has to say. Uh, my end. Any other co do commission member, other commission members have any questions or comments before we open up to the public? Uh, Harry. Uh, not a commission member, of course, Harry Smith, town planner. However, just before it, it may get lost, if I could suggest everywhere where Evan's suggesting town planner, add in or his designee, just so I can delegate to my assistant town planner, if that's appropriate. Okay. Sure. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Chuck Anders Chair. Any other comments from Commission Members or staff before we open it up? Hearing none, then let's open up to the public. Any member of the public wish to comment on this item? Uh, looks like uh, Bill Loopy is up first. Uh, hi, can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Hi, uh, my name is Bill Loopy. So uh, uh, my property is uh, adjacent, my backyard is uh, primarily what we're talking about here. Um, I, I like most everything I heard. Um, the one thing I would like to see is the continuation of the, of the fence, um, where it's, you know, where the fence is now. Um, I'm not really sure the reason why they didn't can just continue and make, uh, make one continuous, uh, fence. Um, I know that the mailboxes are in that area and the, there's no, there's no, there's no parking there. So the, the, um, the property extends or the, the grass extends out to, you know, the original road. Uh, but that's, that's something I, I think I would like to see. Um, as far as the fence coming down to the ground, uh, I'm really not opposed to the way it's, it, it is right now. I understand um, some of the reasoning why it was done like that. Um, maybe for, for snow or, or that I think that was primarily for the snow, snow removal. Um, and as far as the plantings, uh, I'm, I'm glad to hear, I'd rather see the, the plantings on the property line. And my only concern uh, with the number, and I don't have a number in mind, and I know it takes a year or two or, you know, for them to fill in, but I would like to see them fill in enough or uh, they're planted enough there so that we're not looking right at the fence. Um, and I think that that addresses uh, my concerns. Thank you. All right, thanks, Bill. I think up next is Sal Milano. Hi, right, Sal Milano, 158 Sunny Meadow Road. I'm the opposite house that we're talking about. The plantings are nice. Um, I, I don't actually live there. I, my, my mom lives there right now, but I have arborvitaes around my pool and they're four to feet, four to five feet wide. They're, they're mature. I don't know how long it's going to take those to be mature, uh, but the panel of the wood, is that eight feet? Can somebody answer that for me? Or is it six? Does anybody know? I would hope that it's six because if it's over that, they would have to be outside of the setbacks. Okay. Yeah. It's not, I, don't, I don't believe it's any taller than six. So my, my, my bigger problem is I want that fence lowered. I don't care if it goes to the ground. Uh, you know, if you drive 91 or 95, you see those 15 foot high walls, the wood goes down to the ground. I was more concerned about the lights when the car is making the turn into the parking space that those lights were going under that fence and hitting uh, the windows of my house. So, I'd rather see the fence go all the way down. The arborvitaes will be a nice effect instead of looking at a, a wooden fence. Uh, I don't think 
that's going to stop the headlights though for years. So what do we do in the meantime? And if and what happens when the trees? Um, I had a bunch of those around my my whole yard, and a lot of them have died. What happens when when they start to die off? Are they going to be replaced, or you know, what do, what do we do then? You know, the meeting is nice now, but getting a meeting together and changing them years from now, what happens? Ah. Uh. Chuck in, sir. Thank you, Mr. Milano. Um, Harry, I don't know if we can put a condition in that if they die, they have to be replaced. Um, Harry Smith, Town Planner, I think Evan has got such a condition already in there, don't you? Yeah, I don't uh, know if yeah. it's just for the two years or something, or, you know, make it long. Typically, we have a condition that requires ongoing maintenance of landscaping on a, you know, in perpetuity kind of thing as part of the requirement of the site plan. Approval is a special exception approval. So I think he's worded a condition, right, Evan? Something like that, I believe. Um, yes. Uh, all landscaping must be maintained as an ongoing requirement of this approval to ensure survival of the landscaping. Any landscaping element that does not survive or that becomes significantly damaged must be replaced in kind. Um, I assume that that was in perpetuity, uh, but. Um, okay. No, I think it is. I'm thinking of maybe holding bonds or something. Those are more limited, but yeah. Yeah, they are. Yeah, Harry Smith Town Planner again. And, uh, you know, if something um, dies and it's not replaced, um, the way the conditions were, that would constitute a zoning violation. Yeah. So it could be pursued. Great. Anything else, Mr. Milano? Yeah, I, I still um, see. I remember when those houses were first built, and a lot of the people used to cut. That it wasn't as brushy as it is right now. And a lot of the people from the condos used to just cut across our yard to go down to where, you know, where Van Usen's used to be and where Goodwill is now. That was a shortcut. So what's gonna happen in the future with that opening behind the mailboxes? It's, it's, it's gonna open that up because it's pretty clear around there with the brush. What's going to stop from going to that outlet center and just making a shortcut path again? Uh, it, it's actually very thick and full right now. That there's no way for people to walk through. That uh, I, I got to disagree with you. Uh, okay. with, where, where Bill has his actually where his garden is, it's it's you can come through right there, and that's about where the mailboxes are. Jim, do you have a can you share your screen, the picture I sent you this afternoon? Is that possible? Yeah, uh, hold on. Hey, Harry Smith Town Planner, sir, can you identify yourself? I mean, you're on the screen as John F. Oh, yeah, John, I'm John, John Fishman from Westford, I'm sorry. Thank you. Um, This is the, this is that space between the fences right now. Plus, we are adding landscaping in here too. Right. We're thinking. And the landscaping out. will go, will go to the fence on both sides. Right. So did you say you're going to drop that fence more? We, we, we are proposed, we are willing to drop it some, yes. Yeah. How much? I don't have that exact measurement. I have to meet with the fence, um, the fence installer. So because I was, it's I was holding off, I was holding off until we had these meetings. So because the fence steps with the slope, you know, it's going to be one of those things where they'll be able to lower it as much as they can. It'll almost be touching at one end, but it'll be off the ground a little on the other end. Yeah. You know, that kind of a thing. Each panel. I have, there's other pictures. Is there fiberglass panels that look like wood that can go in, in that short spot of the fence that would match the, the wood part? I, that it, I it was the it was the slope 
that was the concern. Um, so this is what I'm speaking of. I mean, you see how this is stepped down to go along the slope. When you lower this so that it's just about touching, this is going to be off the ground at this end. There's nothing you can do about that. You can't have the fence. It won't. You can't mount it to the post without keeping it square. You have a picture of the other side. I'm on the other side. Uh, <laughs> this is, yeah, this is the <clears throat> this is the other side. Same kind of thing. See how this steps. So it won't be perfectly even all the way at the bottom, but they'll be able to get fairly close. Ms. Rolano, any other comments? I understand you're concerned about the fence and we'll ask uh, about continuation of the fence. Um, but do you have any other comments? No, I, I think if we can get the fence close closer to the ground, um, I'd be happy. The, you know, the arborvitaes are going to be nice. I understand that. Um, we'll have to see what happens behind the mailboxes. Okay. I wouldn't plan. I, well, just one other thing. The, somebody mentioned for Cynthia's. Please don't plan for Cynthia's. They they just grow like wild wildfire and they're they're horrible. <laughs> it took me years to get rid of all the ones I had in my yard my yard. They just you just gotta keep trimming them and trimming them and trimming them and they just they grow like bamboo. Um Sharon Hutner here. Uh, I have to agree because for Cynthia's are not native in addition. So um, a native alternative would be spice bush. If you're looking for something with a um, yellow um, spring flower, so we could change it to spice bush. Uh, again, that was the fill in that area. Uh, there was something, uh, Jim Preddy again, something that uh, um, said before that made me thought. Uh, I believe John has already talked with plowing company and told them to plow along sideways here, not up to the fence. So that's why lowering the fence isn't really. Um, concern anymore you know from uh, from this side um so that's why he was willing to lower that now but again they were told to plow the other you know yeah for the ends not, toward, not toward, the toward the fence that's right so that, that's fine great uh thank you mr milano other members of the public wish to comment uh yes i believe mr lupi once more uh, yeah up. Uh, can can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, in, in answer to uh, Sal's first question, uh, the the each panel each fence panel is eight eight feet wide, uh, six feet high, eight feet wide. So when I was estimating and doing some measuring, um, from from one end of the fence to the other end of the fence, including the gap in between. Uh, I came up with around 180 feet. It may not be that long. It may be closer to 160 or so. Um, and we were thinking the arborvitae like every four feet or so, because I'm thinking even if, um, even if they're, when they're planted, I know it's not going to fully cover, cover the fence, but as they mature, um, they will. And, and that's fine, fine with us. Um, the thing I, I really want to um, emphasize is I, I really like to see the fence completed or continued so that the two fences are become one, so that there is no gap. It's fairly level up there. I don't see a reason why it can't be done. Um, and I don't know what really why it wasn't done uh, from the beginning. Um, and I think that's it. I'd be, you know, with those two, two, those two things done, I think we'd be uh, satisfied. Thanks. Thank, thank you, Mr. Lupe. I think Pete Riley wants to uh, wants right. to Right, yeah, I think he's been asking. Yeah, Evan, is he next? Yes. Well, thank you very much. Um, I just want to ask um, Mr. Lupe and Mr. Milano uh, what, what the effect of the lowering of the fence was. My, I was always under the impression that we were talking about an extension of the bottom of the fence to the bottom. 
not realizing others might have been thinking in terms of just lowering the entire fence. So if the, if the fence got lowered, uh, guys, what, what do you think the effect would be on the upper end of the fence? Would that, is, that, is that okay with you? Or were you thinking along the lines of an extension to the bottom as well? Sorry, Bill, I keep muting you. Still muted. How's that? Perfect. Uh, yeah, I was thinking along the lines as Pete was. I thought uh, it never occurred to me that they would lower the, the, the entire panel. Uh, I was thinking an extension down to the ground. Um, in, in behind my yard or behind my, my house, what they have done, uh, the headlights really don't come through. Now behind Sal's, uh, Sal's house, it may be a different story. Um, that's why i am been a little um, lenient with that. It's, a, you know, since they put the, the fence up, it's low enough to the ground that I'm, I'm okay with it. Once they put the arborvitae in and they start maturing, I'm not. I'm not even going to see that gap. So, um, but Sal may have a little, little more issue with uh, with the light coming through, just because uh, the how high you know how high he is and uh, and the cars uh, that are coming in, into his parking space. But uh, again, I, I was long uh, thinking along the same lines as Pete Riley that uh, they were going to just extend the fence down to the ground. Now move the entire. Uh, thank you. Did Mr. Milano want to comment? Sure. I was hoping the fence would stay at the height it is. The problem that we have is when a car takes a swing into that parking space, or one of those parking spaces on my side, the headlights um, are hitting the house and they hit two corners, you know, the back corner and in the side of the house. So those are the two bedrooms. So, like I said the first time, not knowing gets a car pulling in, it's like someone shining a flashlight in your your window in the middle of the night. You don't know what it is. So I'm trying to stop that from happening. So I was just hoping that they put put extensions on the bottom of that fence, not lower the whole fence, keep the fence at its height, and have to continue with some sort of paneling down to the ground. Thank you, Mr. Milano. Mr. Riley, do you have additional comments? I think that on the map, it does uh, uh, offer that as an alternative solution. Um, it, the, a lot of the writing is very, very small, but um, I did read it all at least at one time. Uh, uh, well, yeah, it's um, in, in the um, detail portion to the left of where it says map references, it, and it's showing a uh, Abervite as, as planted, and then it's a future look. It says existing fence requires fence to be, I think it says something, to be lowered within three inches of, I can't make out that word, it looks like finger, but I can't uh, finish. I, I can read it. It says finished grade. The alternate to lowering the fence was to add, um, add existing yeah. post to the bottom. Uh, no, I can't read it. Okay. Well, it goes on to say alternative to lowering, lowering is, uh, is to add. Right. And add so there's the to the bottom. And, and so it does have an alternative on the plan, which I believe is, is an extension. Am I correct on that? Add do you think? The fence and yes. Okay. Yes, that alternate was on there. Correct. So I think that's what the gentlemen are uh, asking. Fair enough. And uh, that's all I have. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Rye. Chuck Anderstier. Are there other members of the public who wish to comment? Evan, you see anyone? I do not see anyone at this time. Okay. Okay, uh, Mr. Pretty, you want to uh, address the public comments? One of the main issues is the extension of the fence. Yeah, so um, we uh, do have that alternate detail on there where they could extend the bottom of the fence without lowering it and sounds like that's what they want. Um, uh, we will change the forsythia to spice bush. Um, we are will increase the number of arborvitaes 
uh, more than 20 up to 40 some number um, to be determined in the field they're going to fit as many as they can and try to get them on the property line and not on the fence line um and i th i think that was it yeah they i mean the other question that was raised was can you actually why do you have to have the gap at all why can't you just have a single fence or there i and there was some back and forth about that you did show the pictures yeah you have heavy vegetation and there was a question about a slope that would you know, make that unfeasible although frankly i don't know why the slope's much different there than it is on either side right you can see in the pictures the way the slope was handled by the fence or the fence uh, installers handle the slope so there probably could be something that it would just mean removing more of that dense vegetation that exists there already um well harris smith town planner well, why can't you stagger the fence or just take it in a couple of feet so it has a little indent closer to the um, access drive away from the vegetation, leave a little extra room. Uh, I don't know, maybe that can be done that way. That'd, that'd be a question for the fence guys, I guess. Yeah, may not be, you know, the perfect visual thing, but it would give more room for the vegetation and close the gap. Stop the lighting issue in the possible right. computer room, I think it was. Yeah. Okay. Any other uh, comments, Mr. Criscola? Or uh, Mr. Preddy, I'm sorry, you say Criscola engineer. <laughs> uh, Mr. Preddy, any additional? Uh, I don't think so. Right. Um, questions, comments from commission members? And staff. I think Mr. Loopy wanted to make one more comment. Yes, absolutely. Mr. Loopy, what you you have any additional comments? Uh yeah, uh just one. Uh in, in regards to something he just said. Um in order for them to put the plantings along the property line, um, they're gonna they're gonna have to do some clearing out. And I just assume that was understood. Maybe, um, maybe it's not, but I mean, there's a lot of growth back there. There's some knockdown trees that I don't know how long have been there, but they're, you know, they, I don't think they did it when the, when the parking lots were put in, they may go way back to when the condos were built for all I know. But, um, and in, some of that stuff, you know, crosses from one side, you know, their property to my property, and from uh, their property to to Sal's property. So, um, I, I'm just, I didn't, I didn't think it needed to be said, but I, I'm assuming that a lot of that, it's, it's, I don't want to call it debris. It's, uh, it's just overgrown stuff, and I'm just assuming it's going to get anything on their side of the property line is going to be cleared out. Do you have um, any com comments about the town planners? suggestion of possibly putting fence out i i know you're sort of commenting that hey maybe they have to take vegetation out anyway but but do you have any thoughts about that option uh that's fine with me uh i i i think once you know he's been up there i've been up there it's right here i i i really can't see the reason why you know i'm not up there right now that the fence can't kind of continue straight across um I'd have to look at it again. So I, 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 I don't see the need for that, mm -hmm. but, um, but maybe I'm wrong. I, I'd have to, I'd have to take a look at it, but that being said, I don't think I, I'd have a, an issue if they had to move, move it out, you know, a foot or, or two feet. Um, you know, from my point of view, I'm not gonna, you know, sitting in my house, I'm not going to know if it's all in line or if it's mm -hmm. a foot away. And then once the arborvitaes are put, put in front of it, I'm not going to see it anyway. So okay. I'm okay with that. Thanks. Um, so I, I would Thank just comment. Um, sure. The, there is there is down brush in there that I'll I'll call it down brush for lack of better terms, but that'll have to get cleared out so they can do the plantings. That's understood. Okay. Um, um, yeah, and I guess that. Well, I guess what what we're looking at in that picture that 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 dense vegetation is kind of probably what that all that dead down brush was uh, similar to. So. Um, that's why we were going to replant 
but yeah, they'll have they'll f have to figure out a way to continue the fence, I guess. Okay. The two pieces. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Any other comments from anyone? If not, then we can close this matter as a public hearing. Uh, this is something I think we'll probably discuss later on, and uh, hopefully, uh, perhaps we can uh, render a decision. Thank you. So thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. So that brings to our next item, which is, uh, I've got to look at my agenda, item number two, which is Daniel Rappendall applicant, the amendments to section 6.16, the alternative energy and 4.18 to allow large scale uh, ground mounted solar arrays as currently defined in section 2.2. I think we opened this matter as a public mm -hmm. hearing, I think back in November, and it's been continued since then. Recollection is that there were that at that time, sort of very close to the hearing, there were some questions about stormwater management, which can be an issue where you have these large, uh, large areas of, of ground mounted uh, of solar panels. Basically, covers and creates a lot of impervious surface coverage in the stormwater management. Harry had had noticed had found some state guidelines addressing that sort of thing for the for the state applications and wanted to look at that more and i i believe that that has been what's been going on uh as as this hearing has been continued so uh with that do we want to is uh is mr rabin do you want to present this or have staff present this or how do you want to proceed yes i'll present briefly and then uh, if staff has further comments, then we'll certainly welcome them. So thank you for uh, considering these uh, uh, changes, amendments for the uh, uh, zoning regs. I'd like to share my screen and bring up the, is that visible? Uh, Harry Smith Town Planner, yes it is. Okay, thank you, Harry. Uh, this is Daniel Rabin. Oh, by the way, I'm on uh, 24 Stone Street in Brantford. Um, this is the document that I believe everybody has in their possession. And the uh, changes under discussion tonight are um, highlighted in yellow. Um, Mr. Andrews, thank you for pointing out the stormwater runoff uh, issue. There was one other issue that had been raised previously, and that was a question about solar canopies. So there is language here um, regarding the solar canopy. And um, I think everybody has seen that. And I just wanted to bring it to your attention as, as a change. Um, you're absolutely correct in that uh, Harry found a, a deep guidance document for stormwater. And there was some question uh, last time as to how to incorporate it into the uh, Brantford regulations. And um, one option was to refer to it. Um, but in discussions with Harry, we came to a solution that we think is preferable. And that was to cannibalize the parts of it that are relevant and create a new Appendix C, um, which was also included in your uh, materials. Oh, no, I don't have to do that. There we go. That's the Appendix C. Um, Dan, I think we lost your screen share. Oh, sorry. Uh, coming back, yeah. Okay. Yep, so this go. is the appendix appendix C document that was actually derived from the uh, deep guidance document, um, and uh, I think everybody has had a chance to review it. There was one late breaking comment on this section in here, and I've made further uh, edits to it in in collaboration with Harry. And I will, for simplicity, I will um, now, do I have to exit sharing to bring that up? Um, I th oh, yes, you might be able to move right over to that. I think it's whatever window you've highlighted, but again, I'm not. 
No. Okay. It didn't work. I'll have okay, to. Okay. Yeah. Um, Pop off and on. Yeah. Yep. Sorry. Okay. Let's see here. No. Nope. Stop share. And share screen. And here we go. Okay. So this is section A. 1D, and it's actually at the bottom of the first page of the document that is in your possession. This here is the original language that is in in the uh, in the the document that you have. Um, there were two changes that were made. One is we removed the permittee language, and uh, uh, and the other one is. Uh, to was this language about uh, being necessary to establish such vegetation and it was changed to uh, is not recommended. So here's the original, here, is the, here are the edits that we made and here is just the same thing that is, that is you know, with edits accepted. So the other um, the other change was in the following paragraph, and this is 2A at the very bottom of page one. And again, this is the original language that, that you are in possession of. And again, the permittee language was removed. And that was because that was relevant to the state document and not relevant to the town of Branford document. And those are the those are the um, the changes that we'd like you to consider. I have nothing else to present. Um, if uh, I I welcome uh, Harry if he has any further comments, and otherwise, of course, I'll be happy to try to address your other questions. Sure, I can share. Thank you, Mr. Raven. Harry, do you want to review? Uh, go over any uh, anything else in a regarding the uh, the changes? Uh, Harry Smith, Town Planner. Actually, I don't have very much at all. Uh, Mr. Raven summed it up very well. Um, the only thing I'll point out is that, um, just to elaborate a little bit, um, the um, state document was actually an appendix to the DEP general permit for construction activities and had a lot of language in it relative to the process of the general permit and applying for it. The references to the permittee, or references to the DEP process. Um, so, in stripping all that away, um, we were trying to create a document that just had um, standards um, to use to design stormwater management system for large scale solar arrays. I mean, admittedly, that document is really geared to larger um, projects, larger um, solar array uh, installations. Um, they're also, just to reiterate, there is, uh, I think we talked about this back in November, um, there is a section in the zoning regulation text, and maybe I'll just share my screen for a second to point that out, or refresh the commission's memory about it. Um, so you should be able to see proposed Amendments to the Brainford Zoning Regulations, October 4th, revised for the January 5th, 2023 meeting. Um, so right below what was referred to the solo canopy language and the change in the reference to the state guidance documents to this new Appendix C, um, from the beginning, we've had this language here. This is alternative design criteria, principles, methods, and practices. And we added in specific reference to Appendix C, may be used with the approval of the commissioner its designated agent. So it provides the opportunity for the commission based upon um, uh, recommendations reviewed by the town engineer to in some circumstances back off from those standards for uh, specific purposes, uh, characteristics of a particular site or what other reasons that might be relevant. Um, so that is pretty much it. Um, In terms of adding any comments, because I think it was really well covered. So thank you. Chuck sure, Anderson, thank you, Harry. Any questions, comments from commission members or staff before we open up to the public? Hearing none, yeah. let's, uh, oh, anyone comment? 
Uh, Joe Chadwick. No. Um, I, I just wanted to confirm that the the appendix is um, non-mandatory because um, there there's some places it, the, the language appears mandatory and some places appears non-mandatory. Harry Smith Town Planner. Um, it's mandatory to the extent that that is um, the language in the regulation text that says itself says shall be based on the best available technology and the design criteria, principles, methods, and practices. It doesn't necessarily say they'd be adhered to in every circumstance. And then there's that in Roman numeral three, that overall ability to deviate from those whatever you want to call them, requirements, or we just call them criteria, principles, methods, and practices. You know, there's a lot, it was tricky, frankly, using a DEP appendix from a general permit um, in place of the guidance document that that general permit appendix replaced. Um, so yeah, we could probably make the language less prescriptive, but I think with the the out, if you will, in Roman numeral three, that gives the commission and the applicant a way to say, wait a minute, this is not appropriate in this particular circumstance. You want to deviate from it. Okay. It's just that the 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 number of variables in something like this are really quite staggering. And they 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 are. And I, I hesitated to tinker with the, the state document too much, not A being an engineer and B it obviously was vetted and, you know, at the state level and put together as something that would be applicable to these kinds of installations. I know they did some research. And if you look at the source statement for some of the graphics, it refers to a document from the state of Maryland. So I assume they reached out and did some investigations of their own to what other states and how are they handling this kind of thing. So I'm simply piggybacking on that and then leaving this out in Roman numeral three for anything that might be needed to be changed in terms of applying it. Yeah, I mean, just, just so long as there's there's some fairly broad um, opportunity for engineering judgment. Yeah, exactly. I, I, noticed, <clears throat> I noticed in the appendix, I mean, they're talking about soil types and stuff like that, which are really quite significant. Um, it, it's just that, that conceptually you can say, yes, this field of solar collectors is an impervious surface. And if I were looking down from a window at a street full of people with umbrellas, I would say, look at all that impervious surface. If I were down there holding an umbrella with my feet wet and water blowing in from the side, I'd realize that the, the, the reality of the water penetration is not, um, you know, my, my head might be dry, but the rest of me isn't. And, yeah. and you get, you know, sheet flow off of the solar collector and rivulets forming underneath the drip line of the solar collector. But then you've got, you know, depending on the soil conditions and the ability of the rest of the soil to absorb. So that, that's why I felt a little uneasy my first reading through the appendix C, but the fact that it is non-mandatory and engin broad engineering judgment can be used makes it a whole lot better. Okay. Chuck <clears throat> here. thank you, Joe. Uh, any other comments, questions from commission members or staff before we open up the public? Hearing none, let's open up the public. Any member of the public wish to comment? Evan, you see anybody? I do not see anyone at this time. Okay, one more time. Anyone wish to comment? Seeing none, then is there any further comments by the applicant? Uh, any further comments, Mr. Raven? No, I just want to thank you all for bearing with us and uh, and considering this application. I appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Raven. Any other comments from commission members or staff? Hearing none, then we can close this matter as a public hearing. So um, thank you. And this is something I hope uh, we can take up in a little bit. And that then brings us then to our next item, which uh, I gotta pull this up, which is, I believe, that's 94 East Main, which, uh, hold on. Ninety four East Main Street LLC care of Stacy Rue, applicant owner, 94 East Main Street, special exception, coastal site plan for the construction of three 
two family dwelling units. We opened this matter as a public hearing at our December 8th meeting. There were uh, significant uh, questions, comments raised by the immediate, particularly by the immediate abutters. It's, um, and uh, the applicant did request a continuance. Um, and my understanding is that, and, and since then, I'll just state for the record, I, uh, I did a site walk, just went over there and uh, just to help orient myself. And I did speak to a couple of the neighbors, not any substantive way they helped orient me, but there were no substantive comment. I just want to state that for the record though. Um, and I understand that the applicant and also we received uh, JC Weiss has submitted a petition in oppositions uh, with numerous signatures. And I understand that the applicant is requesting continuance. Mr. Preddy, is that correct? Um, I think Mr. Preddy might be off the call already. This is Harry Smith Town Planner. Um, I can't see him on anymore. Okay. But I will say, yes, we have received a written request to continue the, uh, the hearing to the 19th. And uh, Mr. Preddy is also, on behalf of the applicant, offered a time extension to allow us to uh, go beyond the 35 days to the 19th. Okay. So um, I was going to... I'm sorry, he isn't here. I was going to suggest, hey, maybe he should reach out to the neighbors <laughs> uh, if he hasn't done that yet. But um, in any event, okay, so we will continue this matter to the 19th. I see some people here. So um, this this public hearing will be continued until uh, our next meeting, which is on January 19th. So if you're here on that one. So thank you very much, anyone attending on that one. So then that brings us then to our next item, which is number four, Matthew Real, applicant and owner, Zero Bartholomew Avenue. This is a special exception and coastal site plan for an oversized accessory uh, structure. I understand that the applicant needs to get a variance and that hasn't been obtained yet. So that, uh, uh, that matter, uh, which it was opened at our December meeting asked that we be continued to the 19th as well. Is that correct, Harry? Uh, Harry Smith, Tom Planner. Yes, uh, we received a request for that very reason uh, for continuation to the meeting on the 19th. And I've also received a, another offer of a time extension because we'll be going beyond the 35 days for the public hearing. Okay, so we'll accept that time extension as well. Great. So matter number four, that's continued to our January 19th meeting. That brings us into items number five, six, and seven, which are all related application. That's BC Investment Property LLC, care of Bruno Sicioni, applicant owner, 175 Cherry Hill Road. It's an 11 lot resubdivision, special exception for two interior lots. And I understand that the applicant is requesting, again, this matter uh, not be even opened, but uh, that we open the public hearing at our February meeting on February 7th. Is that correct, Harry? Uh, Harry Smith, Tom Planner, yes. They've requested the hearing be, uh, the whole, all the applications be tabled to the 2nd of February. Um, sure I'm talking about the right date. Yeah, the 2nd of February meeting and um, there is an additional um, special exception required that will be applied for. So everything can be considered at the same time and there are, uh, several comments uh, made by staff in the town engineer's office. Um, so uh, the applicant's engineer wants to address all of that before they come back. Okay, so then for matters five, six, and seven, if you hear on that, again, that's the 11 lot resubdivision. That matter is not, we're not even gonna open the public hearing on that one. Uh, there's another application that they neglected to file that has to be part of the package. And so that will be uh, scheduled, uh, we expect, on February 7th. Yeah, so again, Harry Smith, Town Planner, they've also offered a time extension to the 65-day time limit to open the public hearing. So I just okay, wanna... great. So we'll accept that. Okay, yeah. so if you hear on that, we're not going forward on that. So um, number five, six, and seven, we're just tabling those. That brings us into item number eight, which is Alan and Cynthia Brooks, applicants and owner, 91 Standard Avenue. Special exception for grading, 6.8, associated with a home addition. Is um, the applicant here on that one? Uh, yes, I believe. Um... Yes, we're here. Okay. 
Uh, can you uh, identify yourselves for the record, please? And uh, this is Cynthia and Alan Brook, owner of 91 Standard Avenue. Um, looking for uh, permits um, for um, uh, setback um, for uh, an additional garage and for um, an additional room um, on the house, the existing house. Um, unfortunately, uh, Pat Panza, who is our general contractor uh, because of illness, cannot be with us today. But um, we did get the variance, um, uh, the variances that we needed on November 22nd. And then there was a condition of the inland wetlands. And um, we um, we passed, you know, we are satisfying and will satisfy more of the conditions that they have given to us uh, for the uh, additions that we want to put on. Um, I don't know what else what else um, need. Um, Inland wetlands was was concerned about um, um, making sure that the in, the wetlands were protected, and we have put up a Pat put up a silt fence. Um, the um, drainage areas have been covered with silt, and um, there was a tree that I had we had taken down that was dead before we even started this process. And um, they want that replanted, and they will um, tell us what kind of a tree and how large. Uh, of a tree to replant. Um, also a catch basin, um, which is going to be put in a um, uh, catch basin and um, a stormwater management overflow um, is going to be dug um, on the side of where the, uh, the house, the um, addition is going to be in the back to make sure if there's any overflow from the roof or when there's a lot of rain that um, it won't, it'll kind of stiffen out, not go into the wetland. Uh, th thank you, Ms. Brooks. Do you have any additional comments? Um, you know, I, I I'm hoping that we can, you know, meet everything that um, is being required by the town so that we can do the additions. Um, we sent all the letters to all of our neighbors. They don't, you know, they've asked Pat just a couple of questions, but they don't seem to have um, any issues with what we're doing. Um, so I'm hoping that we'll be able to get the permit. Great. Thank you, Ms. Brooks. Evan, did you prepare the staff report on this one? Um, I did. Uh, so as Ms. Brooks had described for us, uh, they're proposing two different uh, additions onto the house. I believe one is for a garage, and the other is for additional living space. Uh, that second addition for the additional living space is about 24 feet um, from a wetland uh, that's triggering the 6.8 uh, for grading. Um, as well as a Inland Wetlands Commission permit, which they received on December 8th. Uh, they also received variances from the Zoning Board of Appeals um, for expansions within um, the front setback, and I believe just a little bit of the side setback. It's really just, you know, this triangle right here uh, that was being proposed to expand within that front setback. Um, the ZBA granted that and all other aspects of the uh, proposed design uh, meet the bulk requirements of the R3 district. Um, they meet the off-street parking requirements. Um, 
no lighting information was provided. However, I put a condition that would require compliance with section 6.7. Uh, they have added silt fencing to their site plan as well as a stockpile area. Um, the grades they propose are compliant. I think they're almost exactly the same as what there, there is today. Um, and based on the application materials, it, it appears that they uh, satisfy the special exception criteria. Um, I did prepare some conditions for approval. Um, condition number one. Prior to the start of construction, erosion control measures shall be installed and maintained throughout construction. And then the second condition is that lighting has to be compliant with section 6.7. Great. Ah, Chuck Industry, thank you, Evan. Um, questions, comments from any commission member staff before we open up the public? Hearing none, let's open it up to the public. Evan, do we, any member of the public wish to comment? Any member of the public wish to comment? Evan, do you see anyone? Anyone that would like to speak, uh, down at the bottom of your screen, there's a reactions button. You can uh, select raise hand to indicate that you'd like to speak or type into the chat. I do not see anyone this time. Okay. Okay, uh, we can close the public portion. Do the applicants have any further comments? We do not. Great, thank you. Any further comments from commission members or staff? Hearing none, then I think we can close this matter as public hearing, and this is something uh, we should uh, we will be discussing in a little bit. So thank you very much. So that then uh, uh, completes our public hearing items. Um, um, uh, Harry, uh, Harry Smith, Town Planner. Oh, it's, there's I'm sorry. one more there's, item. There's one more. Um, one more. I forgot number nine. <laughs> yeah, they are piling up. <laughs> Yeah, uh, number nine. Yeah, we need to open and continue this, this one. Is that right? Yes. Um, the applicant uh, apparently did not, I believe was not, was not able to send the notice to Steve Butters in time. So they're going to do that. And the request is to open and continue the hearing to the 19th to allow that to happen. Okay. So then on item number nine, if you're here for that one, we are opening that matter as public hearing as, as uh, read in the notice, but we will continue that to our next meeting which again will be on January 19th. So if you're here on that one, that will continue that to our January 19th meeting. With that, I think that then completes our public hearing items. So um, then turning then first to minutes, uh, I believe uh, the minutes from the December 8th meeting were sent out and uh, had a chance to review those if someone would like to make an appropriate motion. Uh, to approve or to prove those uh, if you thought they were okay. Red, okay. so make some motion to approve the minutes. Okay, motion made to approve the December 8th minutes by Fred. Is there a second? Chadwick seconds. Joe Chadwick seconds. Any further discussion? All those in favor, Joe Chadwick. Chadwick is in favor. Fred Russo. Fred Russo in favor. <clears throat> Joe Bayuso. By you, so in favor. Marcy. Marcy's in favor. And chair is also in favor. So those minutes are adopted. Any correspondence, Harry? Uh, Harry Smith, Town Planner. Yes, we do have a couple pieces of correspondence. Um, one is a request from uh, Desegregate Connecticut to um, come to a meeting of the commission and discuss some of their. Um, proposals to the legislature. Um, we can take that up a little further, maybe under a town planner's report uh, to see what the commission would want to do with that request. Um, also uh, received a, a communication from the United States Department of the Interior with respect to a, a offshore um, um, wind farm um, posed pretty well off of Martha's Vineyard to the south and well to the east of Block Island. However, the cabling will extend through Long Island Sound, and I can put a little graphic up, um, to New York City in the New York side of the sound. And uh, there'll be a side cable, if you will, to um, I believe the Dominion Complex in, um, in East Lyme. Um, but I can just show you very quickly what that is. Um, 
So this is the letter and So you can see the locations down here with the cursor, well to the south of Martha's Vineyard and even further to the east of Block Island and Nantucket's over here. So here's the root of the cable, but apparently it's all within, I, my understanding is New York waters. And there's a little side connection over to, I believe, East Lime with the uh, existing nuclear power plant. Um, so I, mean, I don't see the impact of Brantford personally, but uh, we did receive this invitation. So I wanna bring it to your attention. Um, they're looking for a response for 30 days from the ninth. So um, if you want to get involved in this, let me know. That's it. Uh, Chuck Henderson, thank you, Harry. If anyone's interested in commenting on that, just get in, get in touch with Harry. So then that, that's it for correspondence. So then let's go back then to the public hearing items that we may be able to address. The first was the Jefferson Woods application. And Evan, maybe you can pull up your resolution. It sounds like we had a few revisions as a result of the public hearing. The things that I caught were extending the fence, at least somehow, or at least adding on either extending the existing fence or adding a new level in front of the mailboxes, lowering the uh, add an extension so that the it goes further down without diminishing the existing height. Um, there was uh, some uh, increasing the Arbovides uh, somewhere between 20 and 40, depending on field conditions and what works. And then the last one was there was a plant exchange. And I think Sharon pointed out, uh, Sharon and Marcy both agreed that something could be substituted for something else. And frankly, I forget what they were. So, um, so th those are the things that I heard. I don't know, how about everyone else? Um, did I miss anything? I believe the engineer stated that no additional arborvitae could be planted because of the topography or something like that. That's what he said, but I thought, I I, I got the sense that, well, I, I heard two things. I thought he they, they there was a reference to arborvitaes, but there was, I thought they said they couldn't do double. No, we can't do double, but they may be able to do something more. But but I don't know what that is. You know, I mean that did I mishear that? I mean that that's what I heard that they couldn't do double because of the topography, but that maybe they could do more. But I don't know what. I think that's Russell, what I, I agree with you, uh, uh, Chuck. You uh, and and I don't know how we frame that as a in the in the conditions of approval. Huh. How do how do we say that? Um, um, Harry Smith, town planner, maybe you say something along the lines of the number of, uh, arborvitae to be planted, um, um, shall be increased beyond 20 to the satisfaction of the town planner or his designee and just sort of leave it to staff to negotiate with the applicant as to how many can reasonably fit in there. Okay. Makes sense. You say that one more time. Uh, the number of arborvitae you got to be planted should be increased beyond 20. Um, you could put in parentheses, but less than 40. I mean, if it's, yeah, all right, yep, yep, but less than 40. And to the satisfaction of the town planner or his designee. And Evan, I might publicly delegate to you right here on the spot that you're my designate. <laughs> so you've been following this very nicely. Um, okay, what what about I, the 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 big bigger thing I heard was the the fence extension. How do we how do we resolve that? And do we? you know, include the additional fence. Harry, you had suggested maybe it could be put in front or- in Yeah, front. I like Evan's wording right here on D actually. Okay. The existing two fences shall be adjoined together to form a single fence. And this shall be extended down or as close to the ground as possible. Okay. Um, that, 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 that's fine. I thought there was a possibility that that one may have to be broken up. So it would be three fences, you know, if, if it, 
I, but but maybe not. You know. Well, I was thinking of a continuous fence, sort of just toggled out around the, sh oh, the, okay. the vegetation. If that's necessary, I don't know. But yeah. I am looking at my uh, my proposed wording in number B, in B, which based on the preamble in number two probably isn't needed. So you could probably just get rid of to the satisfaction of the town planner because that's just redundant because it's a those words are already there above. So okay. sorry about that. Okay. Okay, so that covers the extension of the fence, the lowering of the fence, uh, the increased arborvitaes. What was the plant re replacement? <laughs> the... I think it was spice bush for forsythia. Right. I, is that covered anywhere? Huh. I mean, um, would the condition number two, number A, the landscaping shall be re the landscaping plan shall be revised to include as many native plantings as possible? Well, on specific references to yeah. yeah you could add in and specifically substituting spice bush for placythia right and, and and we've decided that that doesn't mean replacing our revitis with something else i think we want our right. right right spice bush was it yes okay. yes that's correct sharon hutner is here right spice mm -hmm. bush and what are we substituting spice bush with for no, the other way around. Oh, the other way around. <laughs> okay. Ice bush so with instead for, for Scythia. Please don't judge my spelling right now. <laughs> Let's give. Is that it? Substitute, substitute yeah. spice for, bush. with spice bush. Yeah, there you are. Excellent. Shouldn't we say substituting spice bush for for? Uh, well. <laughs> yeah, I think we got it. Whether it's okay. yeah. Okay. Would that reverse it again? Yeah, yeah but then you're saying four for Scythia, so it's a little odd. But substituting <laughs> <laughs> for Scythia with so, substituting spice juice in exchange. Yeah, there you go. Or it's something. In, lieu of, in place, in place of yeah, whatever. In place yeah. of, for stuff, yeah. <clears throat> okay, okay. Is there anything else? I think that was it, right? Um. Yeah, I think that was it. Okay. And then we we gave them a you know six months to do it, right? Because we want them. They've already got the benefit of the other the other stuff they did years ago. What they wanted to do, they said. <laughs> so they want to do the the real stuff too. So, okay. So, um, okay. Any anything else? Anyone has any anything else? If not then. Does someone want to make a motion to approve this application by adopting the staff recommendation findings and conditions as amended, and that's presently. Uh, displayed in force in front of us on the Zoom screen. Chadwick will make that motion. Motion made by Joe Chadwick. Is there a second? Fred Russo will second that motion. Second by Fred. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Joe Chadwick. It, Chadwick is in favor. Fred Russo. Fred Russo in favor. Joe Vallejo. Marcy. Marcy's in favor. And chair is also in favor. So that application is approved. The next item is the uh, solar amendments. Harry, do you um, uh, do you have anything cold, uh, prepared for that? Harry Smith Town Planner, I do. And let me put it on the screen. So you should be able to see a memorandum for myself um, to the commission dated today. Um, and I just frankly reworked um, a proposed motion from a prior application to reflect this application. Um, so this would, um, should you choose to make the motion, um, 
approve the application has been amended through tonight, um, effective February 3rd, 2023, based on findings, the plan of conservation development has been considered and that the proposed amendments are in accordance with a comprehensive plan and are consistent with the goals and policies of the Coastal Management Act. Okay, and we need an effective date on that? Uh, incorporated in there, February 3rd, I just picked just to oh, be okay. sure. We would- um, Effective February 3rd, great. It gives us an extra week in the paper, just in case. Excellent, okay. Um, any questions or comments on anyone? I think uh, the, uh, Joe, you made the point that the, we have this bulk you know, appendix, but our, you know, which is fairly specific for big term stuff, but uh, but the text itself allows us to use alternatives, if, if, you know, under our discretion. So, so it's not really mandatory if they have a good reason to get out of it. So, so with that, does uh, someone want to make a motion to adopt the staff recommendation to approve these applications by uh, adopting the resolution? Uh, in the staff recommendation dated today. Fred Russo so moves. Fred makes a motion to approve the zoning regulations text amendments in accordance with the staff recommendation. Is there a uh, second? So by you, so seconds. Second by Joe. Any further discussion? All those in favor, Joe Chadwick. Chadwick is in favor. Fred Russo. Fred Russo in favor. Joe Valuso. Favor. Marcy. Marcy is in favor. And chair is also in favor. That brings us then to, I believe, uh, old business. And uh, we have a number of items. Item number one, Paul Krisky, 65 Sunset Beach Road, Coastal Site Plan. I understand that's been withdrawn. Is that correct, Harry? Uh, Harry Smith, Tom Planner, yes, that has been. It withdrawn in writing. Okay, excellent. And also number two, um, Michael Sullivan applicant, Mark Martha Squires, 24 Summer Point Island Coastal Site Plan. That has also been withdrawn? Yeah, also withdrawn in writing. Okay, so those two have been withdrawn, so they're off our agenda. I have number three, um, Central uh, YMCA, special exception modification for EV charging stations understand that although that's on the agenda that was something you could approve as a minor modification and so that's already you've approved that so we don't need to act on that is that correct uh harry smith town plan i haven't quite approved it yet but you do not need to act on it you can simply table it to the next meeting at that point i probably will have approved it or acted okay. on it. yeah okay so we'll just simply table item number three and if it's necessary for us to act on it we can but otherwise harry may be able to handle that which brings us then to new business, which uh, looks like a number of smaller items. <laughs> uh, uh, item number one um, uh, looks like um, we, they're requesting a waiver of the public hearing, uh, but that's something we would uh, probably be able to take up at our next meeting, do you think, or what? Um. Harry, so Tom Plan, I'd suggest if you're so inclined to grant the waiver tonight so the applicant uh, knows which way they need to go. Um, okay. I think uh, maybe Evan can elaborate, but this was uh, before the commission previously and uh, a survey was um, um, desired and requested and the applicants not provided that. So I believe it's in fairly good shape, but I don't know if we've done the formal complete review, but Evan, I'll, I don't know if you have anything to add about that. Um, it did not come before this board, but it went before the town center board, and they had requested that the survey be done. They had a few questions about circulation in the back, um, the applicants proposing um, pretty minor addition onto the existing three-family home, um, most of which is going to be used for a garage and I think a single bedroom. Um, it's a modification of their previous special exception for three-family in that district. They got their approval from the town center board um, at their last meeting and uh, just seems like a pretty minor um, application in nature. So staff recommends um, waiving the special, the public hearing for this special exception modification. Any questions, comments from uh, commission members? 
not then does someone want to make a motion to waive the public hearing for this uh, special exception application 56 58 Harrison Ave. Chadwick will make that motion. Motion by Joe Chadwick. Is there a second? Fred Moose will second that. Fred seconds. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Joe Chadwick? Joe Chadwick is in favor. Fred Russo? Fred Russo in favor. Joe Vayuso? Vayuso in favor. Marcy? Marcy is in favor. And chair is also in favor. So we've waived the public hearing on that one. And then I think items number two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. There's how many, many, like <laughs> most of them are accessory apartments. One's yeah. oversized accessory structure. Um, but they're, they don't seem to be major applications. Is that correct? Uh, Harris, the town planner, we have not reviewed them all in detail, but that's my understanding. Um, we'll try and uh, schedule as many of these, probably probably all of them on the second. If for some reason we can't get to one of them, we can always continue a public hearing, but be great to get you know as many of these done as possible as fast as we can. Um, so we could rely on the uh, standing motion to uh, uh, for the commission to defer to uh, myself and, and you as the chair um, to actually set the public hearing date. But. Okay, that sounds great. So we, okay. we will do that. That brings us into other business. Uh, looks like item number one of other business is a bond establishment for 471 East Main Street. So Harry or Evan, who's covering that one? Um, I think Evan's got it. Uh, the Blue Point Apothe Apothecary LLC um, requests uh, to establish a financial guarantee for outstanding lighting and landscaping requirements at 471 East Main Street. Um, and it is recommended that the commission approve uh, the exterior parking lighting bond in the amount of $22,000 and the landscaping bond in the amount of $12,000. Uh, and this memo is from the Zoning Enforcement Officer, Jane Ellis. Any questions from anyone? If not, then does someone want to move to establish the bonds in the amounts as uh, recommended by the zoning enforcement officer for the landscaping and uh, parking lot lighting, was it? Yeah, I believe it's. Move by you, so moves to, to go with the bond. Okay, Joe moves to uh, establish the bonds and those as recommended by the zone enforcement officer. Is there a second? Fred Russo seconds. Second by Fred. Further discussion? All in favor, Joe Chadwick? Chadwick is in favor. Fred Russo? Fred Russo in favor. Joe Bayuso? Bayuso in favor. Marcy? Marcy is in favor. Chair is also in favor. Next one is a bond establishment for 173 Hotchkiss Grove Road. Uh, yes, uh, Fisher Excav Excavating has requested a bond for outstanding landscaping at 173 Hotchkiss Grove Road. It was recommended that the commission approve a bond in the amount of $1,500 for outstanding landscaping. And again, this is uh, from Zoning Enforcement Officer Jane Ellis. Great. Questions, comments? Not someone make a motion to establish a bond in the amount of fifteen hundred dollars for outstanding landscaping for one seventy three Hotchkiss Grove Road as recommended by the zoning enforcement officer. Fred Russo, so moved. Moved by Fred. Is there a second? Chadwick seconds. Second by Joe Chadwick. Further discussion. All those in favor? Joe Chadwick. Chadwick is in favor. Fred Russo. Fred Russo in favor. Joe Vayuso. Vayuso in favor. Marcy. Marcy is in favor. Chair is also in favor. Next item is uh, Matthew and Stephanie Milano, applicants and owners, 125 Thimble Island Road. Looks like a request for a 90 day time extension uh, for the time to file the mylars for the subdivision. 
for the two lot subdivision. Um, what's going on with that, uh, Evan? Um, the applicant, as part of their application and approval from you guys, uh, proposed to donate land um, adjacent to Westfield Park. Um, and uh, part of that process has to be approved by both the Board of Selectmen and the RTM. Uh, they were approved last week by the Board of Select, or actually this week by the Board of Selectmen. Uh, now they're just waiting to get onto the agenda for the RTM. Um, and I believe uh, the 90 days should more than cover that. Um, so that's why it's being requested. Okay. Uh, someone make a motion to approve the 90 day time extension to file the Mylar for the subdivision for 125 Thimble Islands Road. <laughs> Move so approved. Uh, motion made by Joe. Is there a second? Chadwick seconds. Joe Chadwick seconds. Any further discussion? All in favor? Joe Chadwick. Chadwick is in favor. Fred Russo. Fred Russo in favor. Joe Bayuso. Bayuso in favor. Marcy. Marcy is in favor. And Chair is also in favor. Next item is a follow-up uh, from the special meeting with the Coastal Vulnerability Working Group. And I think we had a special meeting. We met with them in November and they recall that uh, after viewing their uh, their PowerPoint presentation. We had, a, I think, a good discussion with them. And uh, so there's uh, some follow-up issues. And uh, I know uh, uh, I, I there was an email from Peter Henschel, and I know Sharon that you, that you were following up on this as well. So we'll start with uh, Harry. What what do you got? What, what's going on from your end, uh, or what what have, what have we received? Um, Harry Smith, Town Planner. Let me take a stab at uh, if putting it in a nutshell. Um, I believe the Coastal Vulnerability Work Group, as part of their outreach, um, is looking to um, see if the Commission Planning and Zoning Commission. Uh, would like to um, engage with them in exploring um, how and what opportunities there may be um, to modify existing regulations and ordinances, starting with what authority um, municipality may have. Um, so I think they, if the commission so inclined to pursue it, um, they'd be willing to um, um, have a couple of members of the Coastal Vulnerability Working Group participate in what would probably be a joint subcommittee between the Planning and Zoning Commission and the Coastal Vulnerability Working Group. Um, is there anything, I don't know, Sharon, if there's anything you'd like to add, I think you. Yeah, um, I, I attended their meeting and um, we talked about this possibility and I think it's a really, wonderful idea. I think we really need to move on this with the amount of climate change that we're seeing everywhere. And I would volunteer to be one of the members of the this ad hoc committee. Thanks, Sharon. Um, it, um, are, are, are others interested? I, I think that's that's the main item at this point is is our do we have people who are, I guess, you know, should we form an ad hoc committee? And if so, do we have members who are willing to serve on it? And Sharon has volunteered. That's great. Are there others or other persons with thoughts and comments? Joe, I, I know your comment was that we should make them uh, Agree to tear down the house when the before the water gets there, right? <laughs> and the, yeah, 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 that's, that's... And that, I mean, that was, yeah. But are are is something you are you interested in 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 this at all, or I, I don't know. I, I I am interested. I, I am not sure how much time I have to commit to it. Right. Yeah. I I mean that's kind of where I'm coming from as well. Um, uh, I, um, Fred, any no, interest? I'm, so, I, I'm just, my feeling is, what's the rush? Mm -hmm. What we're talking about is something um, that is not around the corner, it's far from around the corner. 
There's always time. I, I don't have any problem with the ad hoc committee doing what they're doing. Let them continue in that vein. I think uh, our participation is too early. There's, there's, we don't have really uh, impending. We have storms and we know all that stuff. We've had them before, uh, but I don't see the urgency of having to join with any other group, whether it's uh, kind of unofficial ad hoc or whatever. At this point, I think we should um, let the group go on doing what they're doing. If they're doing good work, God bless them. Uh, but when, there, when it comes a time where our input is really and truly needed, I think that's that's when we should get involved. If we should get involved at all, I'm not really so sure we should be involved with them. I'm not uh, fond of being involved with an ad hoc committee because in some way that committee can or may in, in one manner or another overstep their bounds. And um, I think as a commission member, I've seen this before where these ad hoc committees and groups come before the commission and they're, you know, they're like, they're on fire. That's got to be done. But then you find out that once it's, it, it's acknowledged or recognized, they really don't do all that much. I mean, there's not really much you can do. And so I, I don't see the reason sort of to rush to judgment on doing anything here. I don't have any objection with what the uh, committee does. As I said, uh, I'm, I'm sure they're doing very good work. I don't have a problem with them reporting to us. But to have a, I don't know, some quasi-official relationship with them, I don't think it's a good idea at this point. Okay. Thanks, Fred. Um, Sharon Hutner here. Um, Sharon. I guess yep. I have to politely disagree with Fred. I, I don't think that we have time to wait. I think that um, Sea Rise is encroaching upon us and especially in our community. And I think that the more proactive we could be in terms of being able to handle situations instead of reacting to um, situations that happen would be better for the town of Brantford. And I really think that it's part of planning and zoning's responsibility to, to be involved in that process. Thanks, Sharon. Uh, let's go around. Marcy, thoughts? Hi, um, I have a lot of thoughts. I'll try to speak in a coherent fashion. Um, I do agree with Sharon from the standpoint is we don't have as much time as we think we do. Um, you know, these, these changes are happening. They're gonna be happening progressively over the next 10, 20, 30, 40 years. And, you know, I don't know about you, but 20 years has flown by, my kids are grown. Um, and, you know, it's important to understand the legacy that we're leaving behind. But, but as it relates to planning and zoning, I mean, I think it would be great if Sharon would represent and go attend to meetings. I don't know where the formal, you know, how formal it needs to be. You know, it would be nice to hear what's going on to understand. I think where I'm having a hard time is bringing it down to the level that we're actively, um, we're actively, you know, changing our guidelines to require change. And I think, you know, I think there'll be things that'll come up progressively over the years. We're already doing now with like, you know, electric start charging stages and whatnot. But, you know, the, the things that I see as happening are very long you know, major sort of sweeping planning types of issues that, you know, we're always going to have to hire outside consultants to address, you know, the, the level of some of the planning moves. You know, I don't think any of us, even with my background, have the tools to, you know, know what we can do. And, you know, I remember seeing some of that in when we were developing plan of development and the, the, the uh, downtown D TOD area. You know, and, you know, I think those are all useful things to have. And I think to have a committee that's working on ideas is always a good thing. But, you know, we're still hearing applications one by one. And it's going to, I think it's going to be a little tricky to distill it down to, you know, oh, this application is, is you know, we're going to deny this and their rights because of sea level rise or something. You know, I, I'm not sure what the long, what the actual items are that we can do to implement change, you know. You know, but I do think it's good to have ongoing discussion about it and to keep it top of mind. So um, I'm not sure 
if that answers anything, but that's sort of my position on it. Sure. Thank, thanks, Marcy. Massimo, any thoughts? Um, I don't really have much on it. Um, I don't have enough information to really um, be uh, that involved in this discussion right now at the moment. Um, so I'm just going to kind of hold back my comments for now and then okay. just sort of research it a little bit further. Sure. Thanks, Massimo. My, my, my general thoughts are that this is an issue that's not unique to Brantford. It's, it's shared it's shared all over the country, but it's shared from a zoning perspective because I think that you know it, it's a reality. There's a there's a local cat, uh, hazard mitigation plan. I thought that was you know in, in the PowerPoint they showed various documents that you know that are relevant. There's a regional hazard mitigation plan. There are some studies going on. I think you know so so the question is what can you do from a planning zoning perspective? What zoning regulations can you actually do? Because we we don't affect building codes, we don't affect FEMA, you know the but but what what can we do and what have others done? I I I think you know as a curious as a curiosity from a planning zoning point of view, I I think you could you could investigate the coastal towns from Greenwich to Stonington. And, and to see if any town has done anything to address this and to see, for, because they would be in the regulations. I know there is a Coastal Area Management Act, obviously that everyone applies, whatever, but I, I would be kind of curious, what, what have actually, you know, has, has anything <laughs> been done from a, a zoning technical perspective? Because I, you know, part, part of what the the I understood the Coastal Vulnerability Group as doing is sort of just, you know, get, getting general education and knowledge and, and awareness out there, and that's great, and and it, it's interesting because when you see the maps and you see the blue and you think, oh, Lenny's, they're going to have lots of floods, so, and this is, you know, water's going to be projecting twenty feet, and the water's going to hit the fountain in the Stony Creek, or whatever. So, so I mean, that that is kind of good, and and it's and it's always good to be aware of that. And uh, that said. What does it, what can you actually do? And because, you know, people have property rights and we have, you know, we're respecting that. And, and for what regulatory provisions can you, can actually be done? I mean, and there's things that maybe you can elevate roads, but that, again, that's not a zoning issue. You can, uh, because you know, the roads get flooded, um, you know, and, and there are the three things you can protect, you can, uh, abandon or you can buffer, I forget what the middle one was. So, so I, I'd be curious to see, and it would be worth, I mean, if that's what the goal is, is to see if anything could actually be done from a zoning perspective, from a regulatory perspective, um, what is it, <laughs> you know, what, what has been done? Look at the zoning regs, see, and, and that's, that's a labor intensive job. That, that, that is something that can be done. My expectation is that maybe you have some, you know, more wealthier suburban areas down in, you know, Greenwich or, or whatever, Fairfield County, that maybe, you know, maybe they've looked at some of this stuff and that's worth doing. And and if if I had extra time, if I were retired and whatever, I'd say, why not? So so that, you know, and that and maybe nothing comes of it. And maybe that in itself is the same. You know, the these maybe the answer could be yes, these are great issues, but it doesn't really affect the planning and zoning regulation world. It protects other infrastructure, other engineering, other sewage disposal, other various other things, you know, but because we're, we're not going to go saying, okay, I, I, I don't know if we, you know, is it going to affect our decisions on applications and what we can do? I, I don't know. So, so I don't have any problems. Sharon Sure. Yeah, Sharon Hunter here. I think that was exactly the exact purpose 
of this group is to explore all of those things. And I think you're right. It it is very labor intensive and, you know, takes a lot of um, research and digging and, you know, pursuing things like the concept of these overlay districts and things like that. Maybe that is something that can come under the pur the purview of planning and zoning. I'm new here, so maybe I'm just being idealistic and, you know, wanting to do something that is is not possible. But I certainly think that it would be um a noble task to pursue it. And if the um, commission really feels that it shouldn't be an official thing out of the Planning and Zoning Commission, then I would be more than happy to go to the coastal vulnerability meetings and yeah, I, I, zone. I think so. I mean, by the way, there is an overlay zone now. It's called the Coastal Area Management. I mean, that that's what it is. I mean, that that is technically an overlay zone. I, I think that that's where you have coastal site plans, anything mm -hmm. within so many, so, so that it, I, I don't think you need another, maybe you do, another overlay zone, but that's sort of where we're relying. I, and that's where we get some deep reviews and, and some of these things that's, and we can rely on that. Um, but, you know, I, 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 I'm happy if, if you, be our representative, you know, and if you got the energy, uh, you know, and you want to do the research, uh, you know, because there's a bunch of documentation out there. Okay. Um, so, uh, you know, and, and, and they're run with it. Um, Harry thoughts. I mean, I, I, yeah. Yeah. Harry Smith town planner. Um, we do have a fairly high application load. So I'll just put that as a caveat before I say anything. Yeah. Um, and it really, I keep waiting for it to go down. It keeps going a little down, a little back up again. Um, I am willing and will offer to kind of provide some technical guidance, if you will, Sharon, if you like. Um, part, a couple of things I recommend throwing out there. One is um, we can work together on a question for what they call the planners listserv, which is an online uh, forum um, and put out there a question to see what there's a quick response because most of the planners and the zoning officers are part of this listserv around the state and mm -hmm. see what communities along the shore may have done if they've done anything in terms of zoning regulation amendments and what authority they think they have. Um, you know, some of the latest attorneys also are part of this. Um, the, the, I know I can think of a couple of people that are presented at other webinars and, you know, maybe we can try to approach them or I can point you to them and, Mm -hmm. see if they have any information on what may be changing. I mean, some of the answers here may be, you know, changes to the enabling legislation in terms of what the commission's allowed to do in the end um, or other approaches really on a statewide level. So, but I'm happy to, to you know, take a few steps with you to do that as I can. Um, mm -hmm. So I'll just throw that out. So Sharon, I mean, because you, you have the time and the interest, it sounds like, and that <laughs> And they, yes. and they uh, desire. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so uh, what, you know, you can sort of be a representative and, and Harry can help you out and you can attend meetings and talk with them. I, because, yeah, that, that's what I'm thinking. Other than talking about this is a major problem, what are we going to do to focus right. on zoning? That, right. I think that's what you need to do. I yeah. need to start with a listserv. What, what have towns? Because it, it really isn't unique. I mean, Brantford yeah. is unique because we got a lot of shoreline, but, but yeah, right. I don't know. But, um, you know, I, I think that would be valuable. Data is valuable, so. Okay, I guess there is an advantage of being old and retired, huh? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I'm getting there, but I'm not getting there. Yeah, no, it sounds like a plan. Definitely, I appreciate, very much appreciate Harry's. Yeah, um, and I, I kind of, anyone that's doing this, I want to support him too in some way, even if it's a little, but I, you know, so, so whatever. So, so great. Lucky you. <laughs> right, right. Okay. And, and I'm happy to bounce stuff off you too, whatever, you know. Sort of oh, stuff. thank you. I appreciate that because we yeah. legally, I, I I'm sure there's stuff, a but... lot of stuff out there that uh, needs to be covered. Yeah. Okay. So, okay. Just um, one more personal point. Um, I will not be here for January 19th or February 2nd. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thanks.
Okay, so Sharon's going to sort of uh, be our representative and and maybe meet with them because they have some, you know, and and c cover, you know, check in with Harry and me. And if anything comes to it, anything looks like it's getting close, we'll report back, or Sharon will report back to the commission and see where we are. So, yep. sounds okay. great. That sound good to everyone? Yep, sounds good. Okay, great. Um, yeah, Joe, I don't even, Joe Bayouza, I didn't even know if I asked you. <laughs> I was going around, I don't know. <laughs> Did I let, let you off the hook? I don't know. <laughs> well. But, but, uh, not any yeah. comment right now. Okay, great. Okay, so next item is item number five, the land use webinar for March 11, 2023. Harry? Uh, Harris, without plan. Before we get there, um, Evan has pointed out to me. I don't believe we um, went back to uh, the public hearing item regarding 91 Standard Avenue. Oh, we didn't. No. Oh, thank you for covering that. You're right. Well, Evan let's, is. Let's take care of that. Thank you for uh, pointing that out. I forgot. I think that. Evan's got his screen ready to share on that, so we can walk right through it. Okay, Evan. What's your What's your uh, recommendations for findings and conditions? Uh, just that erosion control measures are installed and maintained throughout construction and uh, any proposed lighting is compliant with section 6.7. Okay. Okay. This seemed fairly uncontroversial. This is uh, <laughs> the only reason they were here was because of uh, 6.8. It was close. And, and so, uh, okay. And so that looks great. <laughs> So are there any thoughts or comments? And if not, does someone wanna make a motion to approve the application by adopting the conditions of approval as recommended by Evan in his staff report that's presently projected in front of us? Chadwick makes that motion. I'm motion sorry, Joe Bayuso did it, got, it, got oh. there first. Okay, Joe Bayuso makes a motion. We'll give Joe Chadwick the second. Any further discussion? All those in favor, Joe Chadwick. Chadwick is in favor. Fred Russo. Fred Russo in favor. Joe Bayuso. Bayuso in favor. Marcy. Marcy is in favor. And Chair is also in favor. So thank you for pointing that out, Evan. Okay, so that brings us back to uh, item number five, which is the Connecticut Land Use Webinar for March 11, 2023. Harry. Um, Harry Smith Town Planner. Um, this is what has been in the past referred to as the Wesleyan Seminar. Uh, it used to be held on the campus of Wesleyan uh, College University. Uh, it's a $45 fee. It runs on Saturday from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. And I had the brochure. Here it is. So that is on March 11th, which is a Saturday again. Um, it's a really well-run, um, very informative seminar. I've been to it in the past. Um, I particularly highlight the section that's going to be presented by our chairperson, um, attorney Andre. Um, so on for zoning enforcement, but there's several other presenters. Um, several of them are attorneys. Um, I think pretty much all of them actually. And this is held jointly by the Bar Association. Yeah, it's sponsored by the planning and zoning section of the Connected Bar Association. It's provided yeah. it's every other year. And okay. this is, uh, it's held in odd years, I guess. And, okay. So. I thought it was annual. I apologize. At any rate, um, um, the department does have money to uh, cover the cost of this for commission members. Um, and I just remind the commission that there is, and I will give you a little more information on this, um, a education requirement that the state legislature has enacted. So I believe it's four units of training, or four hours of training, one of which I think needs to be affordable housing, if I'm correct. Um, so I believe this seminar would address, I think, all of those um, requirements. And I'd strongly encourage people to consider going. Um, staff here, at least some of the staff here, is probably going to go as well. Um, so we can get the brochure out to you. Um, and um, those that are interested, um, perhaps we can sort of facilitate the, um, the application process. I can basically include a copy of the brochure in the next packet of the commission. Harry, can I ask a quick question, it's Marcy? Sure. Do the commissioners have a requirement to do a certain number of hours every certain number of years, like the CEO requirement? 
Yeah, I think it's annually. And I'll have to go back. I, I apologize for not having this right at the tip of my tongue, but I will include that in the packet also so everyone knows what that is for the next meeting. Yeah, I don't know. It's, it's every year, every two years. But I can't recall either. Yeah, but it, it's four hours. And so, so that's something that we, you know, each, if you serve on a commission, on a land use commission, that could be planning, zoning, or wetlands, or ZBA. You're supposed to do four hours a year, one of which, over the year or two years, I don't know which one, one of which should be an hour on affordable housing. And if you do this thing, you would, you would get it done. I mean, that, I think that's one of the accredited organizations that, that would, could do it. Sharon Hutner here. Um, these um, proceedings have been recorded and you can access some of the older ones on the clear site if anybody's interested in looking at some of the older proceedings and seeing what they're like. Yeah, the clear, the clear site has separate uh, seminars on, mm -hmm. I think there's like map reading, uh, conflicts of interest, and there's one other ones in each. I think that counts as, as hourly stuff as well. This is something yeah, a little well, bit separate. That, I think I was able to access an old um, recording of the entire proceedings. The Wesleyan one? Yeah, Maybe. I saw you oh, there and Marjorie oh. Shanksky and a whole bunch of other people. Okay. Maybe we're on there. Yeah, that was from the 2021, I think. Yeah, uh, maybe. Okay. Or, two, or 2019, maybe? Or, yeah, there was a 19. Every odd years is when it mm -hmm. was. Yeah. So, um, but, you know, there have been a few changes in the law, particularly the last, like, for example, mandatory education. That's new. So yep. so, so look at the yeah. new stuff, you know. <laughs> um, they uh, have been a number of new things. So it's, it's yeah. go with the new one if you can, so. You sign up for the course, you get the small book. That's true. Yeah, I forgot to mention that. You do get a nice, uh, handy reference book. Right. So I will uh, facilitate this, and I will actually include also a link just so people have it. It's it's capital C-L-E-A-R, Connecticut Land Use Education, something, something. I can't remember the acronym, but mm -hmm. um, it's through, I believe, in the extension service. Um, So we'll get that out to folks and hopefully some of you will be able to attend. Okay, great. Thank, thanks, Harry. Sure. Um, number six is planner's report. You got anything else for us? Um, Harry Smith Town Planner, uh, just to go back to this um, um, request for um, the commission to provide an opportunity for the uh, desegregate Connecticut representatives to come and talk to you. Um, I guess my quick take on it is um, I think we can only benefit from being additionally informed, but we do have 20 applications on the agenda at the moment. So um, possibly um, waiting a little bit to the application load is dropped a little, might be uh, the best in terms of, I mean, this meeting's already after nine o'clock and this frankly is probably one of the shorter meetings we're gonna have in the next couple of months, just to warn you. Um, <laughs> so let me know what you want to do though. Um, uh, Sharon Hutner here. Is there any way that maybe they could put together a presentation for us somewhat the way the Coastal Vulnerability Committee did and at least have us look at a presentation so we can at least get some information up front and do it sort of at our own pace? I will check about, with them about that, yeah. That might be a good solution temporarily. Yeah, my, my, my sense is that it, it, it's that what, what they're emphasizing is, is a transit oriented development type of things, housing near train locations. We have a train station. We've looked at this. We've actually approved some hundred in Mariner's Landing. That was one of the rationales is that the additional 170 units or whatever it was we approved was because it's right next to the train station. So, I mean, it's that that's something they're promoting across the state, I think. Uh, so, I, I you know, I, I think it's it can't hurt, um, but 
I know our agendas are pretty busy, but um, you know, I I I, I don't want to. You know, it, it, it's it's better to know, better to hear than not hear. So 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 yeah, I think it, it would be helpful. Uh, but but I agree with Harry. You know, it looks two things. One uh, is you know get something. Perhaps they have something they can give us in advance that you know educate us. And then second, you know, it, make it when we have some time. So. Does that sound good to everyone? Yeah. What what sort of duration are they looking to do this presentation? Is it like, hi, this is what we're doing, or is, is this like the subject of a special meeting? Uh, it's unclear. Um, you know, I can summarize the little email I've got here, and I could send this around too. Um, uh, email to request me at an FA meeting to present a short brief on our upcoming state level proposal. They call a work live ride. Um, so I think this is a looking to educate the commission about their legislative um, agenda, as mentioned by Chuck. Um, they're looking to explain it, answer questions, and take some feedback. So, I mean, it could be an hour discussion, half an hour discussion. I think to do it just, I'm guessing, it would probably take them, you know, 20 minutes, half an hour to present. And then the commission, I would imagine, would want to ask some questions and engage in a discussion, which could take, you know, half an hour or an hour. So, that could be a significant hunk of a regular meeting and or, you know, the separate standalone topic at a special meeting, which, you know, I mean, you guys tell me what your appetite is for, um, you know, we may end up with some, frankly, three to four hour meetings in the next couple of months. Um, so let me know what you want. I mean, I'm happy to get back to them and, uh, and follow up in whatever direction you want me to go in. Yeah, it, it sounds like they're going to introduce some legislation and they're looking for people to probably support it or yep. critique it. So, um, and, and it's geared towards transit oriented. I mean, you know, that's, that's what it's. Yeah, they had a bill last legislative session that right. did not pass. But Yeah. So, so, so I, I you know, I, I have some caution about just saying no. You know, uh, just because I, you know, that it, it appears you're closed minded and you don't want to hear this. And, then, you know, but but we do have real constraints um, and, and we've done our own studies on some of these issues as well. But I think it's it's good to know. So, you know, I I suggest maybe that that would be my suggestion. I think that we. Um, try to get some information from them they, and tell them we got this and maybe a few months down the road, depending on how it is. Yeah. yeah. All right. I will get in touch with them and I will um, see if they have anything in terms of a canned presentation or even a, a written proposal I could share with commission members and then let them know we will try to get them on an agenda at some point when uh, we have a little bit of extra time. Yeah, yeah I, I would not be opposed to a special meeting in order okay. to seem, you know, I, I don't want to seem non-responsive and having heard an awful lot of this um, on, on Friday evenings on the Fairfield NPR station, they usually, they, they've been having these series. Um, I, I don't want to be on the wrong end of that perception. I agree. Yeah, I mean, it could be a good opportunity for some give and take too, to, you know. Um, I yeah, I agree as kind well. I'm kind of glad they're doing this, so, yeah. Okay. Partner here, I think we should get some information. Okay. Well, let me start and see um, what they may have, and we could also talk about it at the next meeting of the commission in you know, a couple of weeks to see what feedback I get. Does that make sense? Yep. Okay. Great. Uh, that's all I have. Evan, I don't know if there's anything else you have in the planner's report. Nope. Okay. Okay. Okay, everyone. Uh, anyone have anything else? If not then uh, someone will make a motion to adjourn. Fred Russo, make a motion. We adjourn. Motion made by Fred. Is there? Chadwick seconds.
Uh, Chuck might be frozen. <laughs> I can't hear him. I can't hear stuck it. We shall be stuck in this meeting forever. <laughs> it's a frozen screen. What in the ether between here and Florida? <laughs> um, can I make a... Uh, yeah, I think you can step in, Fred, if you like, temporarily. Last <laughs> vote, <laughs> Joe? Uh, Chadwick is in favor. Fred Russo's in favor. Uh, Marcy? Marcy's in favor. Good job, Fred. Good night, Joe. How about you so in favor? Who did I miss? Chuck. Uh, I think he's gone. I think he we lost gone. him. So Okay. So, uh, so I, it's I only the four. Yeah, all right. So uh, all right. Good night, everybody. Good, good night. night. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. This program was brought to you in part through the support of the Town of Brantford. Watch town meetings and other videos on demand at BrantfordTV.org.